Welcome to the Politics of Everything. I'm Amber Danes, your host and podcast producer. This is a half hour of power, a podcast dropping every week where I unpack the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment, equality, and much, much more. Our guests are seasoned in the field or topic of their choice, even if you've not heard of them yet. This is a non-partisan show. So while I love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate of ideas, this is not a purely blue, white, green program. Please subscribe, tune in and enjoy the politics of everything. Data is the name of the game for Alice Almeida, the founder of Almeida Insights, a full-service research agency and the regional head of data research and insights for Totally Awesome, APAC's leading kids' digital platform, which prides itself on providing safe environments for kids to be entertained. Her career has spanned over 20 years where she's held senior data and research positions for some of Australia's largest media brands, think Channel 9, 7, News Corp and Fairfax. She launched her own research company, two weeks prior to COVID-19 hitting last year to tackle the topics that many shied away from, in particular delving into social media data privacy and what the average Australian actually thinks and knows about it. She's not one to back away from a challenge and because of this is constantly called on for opinion on industry issues. Throughout her career, Alice has held representative positions on industry councils, launched market first research pieces, has been called on to provide evidence and insights into the Senate inquiry into public interest journalism, and she's well known on the conference circuit, all about data. In her recent her current role at Totally Awesome, Alice is responsible for building out insights and thought leadership pieces on how brands can safely and respectfully advertise to children and parents. And as a mum herself, she feels protecting children's online data is absolutely non-negotiable. Welcome, Alice. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So did you have a dream job as a kid and did you end up doing that? I'm imagining data wasn't really a thing other than becoming a librarian maybe. Like what, what was your early wish to be when you grew up? Yeah, so funnily enough, it had absolutely nothing to do with numbers. In fact, my my dad still shakes his head and laughs at me now that I'm working in this field. He's a chartered accountant and he he used to do my maths homework with me and he used to get so frustrated because he's just like, you're just not interested. But I wanted to be a nurse, funnily enough. So uh, my mum is actually a nurse and uh, when I told her one day that I wanted to be a nurse and in particular a a paediatric nurse, she said, absolutely not. No way in hell are you going to be a nurse, <laughs> which, you know, was not the answer that I was expecting. But it's not exactly encouraging. No, Thanks. no. But, you know, <laughs> my mum knows me best and she, she knows I faint with needles. She knows that I faint at the sight of blood and she knows that I get emotionally attached to everything. So that's not really a great fit for a nurse. So she suddenly kind of redirected me into another route away from nursing and Certainly, I don't think either of them expected me to work in data. So data is everywhere for businesses. How has its importance and use changed over the past decade or so? Uh, Look, massively. I feel like we're kind of doing a bit of a full circle at the moment. So, you know, when I first started in data and research and insights 20 years ago, it was, you know, you were working with very limited data. And in fact, data was not cool back then. And just to kind of give an example of how uncool it was, I was re- when I moved into the the research and data department at Channel Nine, I was actually put in what was seemed to be a VHS tape cupboard. Well, that takes us back. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, showing my age. But you know, it, 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 I was it was part of the sales department, but it was hidden right at the back. That obviously made a complete switch. And funnily enough, ten years into my career. I was wheeled out with the sales guys because they really wanted to kind of share insights to clients and show the insights, um, show the clients that they were, you know, the experts in the field and obviously data and insights could do that. So I went from being one of the least popular parts of of Channel 9 to being the the person that they, they would roll out for meetings. So the popularity of data took a massive shift. With that became this mass panic where people thought my god data is gold data is king it's the year of data and everyone went on this mass collection we've got to know everything we've got to collect this and that 
whilst for some companies that actually had the structure in place to be able to cope with that mass collection of data, or they had the intelligence in-house to be able to store and manage and read and interpret that data, most didn't. Most just collected a whole heap of data and it just sat there and did nothing for a very long time. So people have now started to clue into the value of data when it's actually utilised, which sounds like a really simple thing, but, you know, a lot of people weren't utilising it. And it's it's now at the point where, you know, data management platforms have, are they're so readily available that organisations have got incredible data warehouses in place now. But what's interesting is there's now been a bit of a shift. So people are slowing down massively on the types of data that they're collecting and they're also being a little bit picky. But I think that shift has kind of been directed more so from consumer control, which is another interesting point. Absolutely. So to me, the idea of obviously gathering data quickly, so it's sort of, I guess, timely seems to be important. Maybe it's not. But how does a company actually go about doing that? So that you, like you say, they don't just collect data for the sake of it. It sits somewhere and it just becomes a bit historical. I mean, how do you get it quickly so that you can actually make good business decisions? Yeah, well, the funny thing is you you probably already have the data. So a lot of companies probably already have the data and they, they just don't know that they have the data or they don't know how to use the data that they have. So a lot of the companies that I work with, um, the first thing they do is a data audit. I, I, I review what kind of data they currently are sitting on, what they could easily and quickly get access to, and that's usually, you know, social media data, website data, consumer data. So it's 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 just kind of understanding what they have already and what they're using versus what they are not but they should be and it's just about doing it it's just about doing the audit and I recommend that with every client that I work with um, because a lot of the time they are sitting on an absolute goldmine of data but they aren't aware of it they also a lot of organizations are very have a lot of silos with their data within the organization so sales will be sitting on an incredible goldmine of sales data and then you've got marketing and they sit on their own data and then you've got finance with theirs and then you've got product with theirs and and there's little linking that goes on between all of the different silos. So it's a matter of just understanding that data, how they work together, and that's the most important step. Once you've done that, if you want quick access to data or if you want to build on your current data, the one is that one of the growing, growing, biggest growing things at the moment in, in the space of data is partnerships. And you'll see it all the time with, I think one was just announced today with Channel 7 and Flybys or the seven network and flybys, I should say. Wow. So the power is in maybe that collaboration. Yeah, because I think a, a lot of organisations are realising that they have incredibly valuable data that would be useful to somebody else and that somebody else has very valuable data that would be useful to them. So about two years ago, I predicted that it would be the year of partnerships, data partnerships. And since then, we've seen some incredibly large organisations come together and, and share share their databases. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's with the, the, the goal of understanding the industry, the process, products, but most particular, the consumer base at the end of it. Absolutely. Look, all the social media sites that we sign up to, whether it be LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, obviously have a lot of personal data that we kind of gift them in a way to use their platform. And privacy settings aside, how can we protect our data and remain still active on these platforms, which are great connectors and sources of news and other information for a lot of us? Yeah, look, it's really, it's really it's really difficult to protect your your data because you know many many organizations can have data breaches and leaks you know you would have seen the recent one with facebook and linkedin there was over 500 million profiles that were data was leaked from you know there there's constant every day there seems to be another industry that's been hacked or attacked and so protecting your data there's not a 100% tried and tested perfect way to protect your data. At the end of the day, if you want to participate in social media, you have to just understand that you are handing over personal data. There are some certain things that you can do to limit the amount of data that you share. And they are things like, you know, I don't access Facebook off an app on my mobile phone. I actually go through um, my Chrome app and access it that way. Now, they are still capturing data, but by not having the app, um, they're not getting... Old school, Yeah, Alice. I know, I know, <laughs> and people will shoot me for this, but 
it just got to the point where I was just getting too creeped out by ads being served to me based on things that I'd had conversations about and had not searched for online that I and and I yes. I work in the space of being able to stereotype and profile audiences and and consumers and I couldn't actually work out how they would have determined that a 40-year-old female would have been the target audience for this. And so there were just too many instances where it was just the ads were just a little close to home and so I, were, I thought that's it, you know, I'm if, if I want to access Facebook, I will access it through my Chrome app. But other than that, I don't have the app on my phone at all. Interesting. Mm. So at News Corp, you had a role to play in, I guess, the world of media and data. Are audiences for mainstream news outlets very nuanced or is it kind of how we think it is where I know for, for myself as a former journalist and I used to work for Fairfax, which is now nine newspapers, you know, we were more sort of right of centre and the Australian newspaper, for example, is seen as quite, sorry, opposite to that, left to centre and then right of centre would be the Australian and some of your more conservative newspapers. Is it is it like that when you look at the data or is it a lot more you know nuanced than that look funnily enough I wouldn't actually describe Fairfax or now nine or seven or any of the big commercial media organizations as being left (laughs) Um, I believe maybe they are middle but I, I think that there's and, and one of the my biggest concerns is some of the loudest and biggest media publications in Australia are leaning to the right, which obviously sways and influences people's opinions and perspectives. And, you know, the likes of News Corp is obviously the biggest and the largest. And, you know, they they it's it's very well known that they are very right in a lot of their publications. And obviously that kind of leads into the audiences that they attract and they appear. However, I need to kind of caveat this a little bit because I've noticed a a shift and a trend in the last couple of months in particular. I've been monitoring how Australians feel about particular issues that are going on at the moment. And one of the strongest talking points out there is the is women and how they're being treated in corporate world, in parliament, in, you know, equality, in domestic violence. And I don't know if you actually saw that there was an ad that was released today around the whole consent towards, yes. you know, men and women. That ad was horrific. And, you know, but this is the kind of mindset that a lot of these big media organisations are coming out with. So they, I think that they've kind of missed the 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 boat on this one because they have an idea of what the average Australian thinks. However, I think the average Australian's opinions are changing very, very quickly. And in particular on this women thing, I think there's a reason that Scott Morrison has done a bit of a backflip. And I think that there's a reason that he's now, you know, he came out saying that he's in support of women. He has a wife and he has a daughter. And I think it's these kind of things that, you know, Australian media is starting to realise. And so where they were historically they were treated as not very nuanced. I think it's actually starting to shift. You see the likes of the women's agenda, which is coming up and growing in popularity really quickly. A lot of the other niche uh, media organisations are growing ridiculously quickly. If you look at the success of the Batuta Advocate, right? Yes. Yes, it's satire. But it's satire with reality. And so I And that's think- what makes it so powerful because it's so true that it's almost it's a bit exactly. shocking. It's almost yeah. like taking the place of the tabloid newspaper to me. Exactly. Know? But do you know what's hilarious? Is that I think that it's those kind of publications that have helped expand the mindset or bridge the gap that was out there. Because, you know, ten years ago you got all of your media from you know, from Fairfax or from News Corp or from Packer, like it was all very kind of very concentrated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas now it's, there's so many different areas that you can get it from. And I think people's mindsets are starting to, to expand and, you know, in particular with, with particular topics, definitely. So earlier this year, taking away our ability to share news from those mainstream media platforms, 
was something that Facebook did as a kind of stealth operation in, in, in the view of many of us that kind of, you know, you can't share this, they're not paying for it, they can't got to pay to play. And But in that they also, you know, cascaded into community platforms like the New South Wales Rural Fire Service was shut down, which obviously is a big issue if you're living in a fire struck area or in the middle of a bushfire, you need access to those things and Facebook's often the platform people have done that through. So do you think it's a case that, that I guess the newspapers and the other media platforms need social media and, and so forth to exist or can they be independent? I mean, where, where do we kind of go from this from this point and what does it mean for data? I mean, obviously data is held in multiple places, but will they ever collaborate on this or is this just something that they've got to kind of fight their own battle on? Look, I, I found this whole whole situation well, embarrassing <laughs> on one point, but I, I found it re- absolutely fascinating because from my perspective, a lot of traffic is driven from social media networks, you know, Facebook to news websites that I probably, I think about my own usage. They, I visit news sites that I probably wouldn't visit because I've seen the article on Facebook, right? So they've got a, a, a not only a, a new visitor, but they've obviously their, their reach has expanded as well. But then on the other side, Australians are starting to have changed their way of how they consume news content. And a lot of that is because they are now accessing news off their feed, off their Facebook feed. So it was really interesting because they were they were both kind of fighting. I'm just using the example of Facebook and news, but they were both kind of fighting, but both of them were benefiting from it. So it was it was a really interesting thing to kind of sit back and, and view. But one of the things that they didn't really consider in all of this was the consumer. And this was something I was quite vocal about because it seemed that the the fight was about news not being paid for content that was hitting Facebook, but Facebook was saying, well, we're giving you a lot. And and I think when they actually switched off the, the news content and they removed a whole lot of other pages which fell into news, I think Facebook kind of underestimated the impact that that would have. And you mentioned the New South Wales fire um, department. There was, there was even things down to, you know, I'm, I am a mum of a three year old and I, I am part of this CPR for kids Facebook page. And it's basically just first aid tips for for parents of young kids and not even a professional platform of any like doesn't no, have that behind no. it yeah this this is a bunch of nurses who have decided to launch this to help new parents particularly navigate what to happen if their kid is choking or is or they've bumped their head really badly or they've got a burn or it's and it was was absolutely vital and and a bit of a lifeline for me on many occasions because I have a very clumsy daughter but to switch off something like that and to switch off something like news content during a global health pandemic that was completely completely you know this is where it just an overreach probably of what what they needed to do to make their point yeah and it's interesting when you talk to people now when you talk to organizations now there's there's some like I think it was stuff.co.nz in New Zealand which has not gone back to Facebook they've gone like no you you know you cut us off so we are we are going to stand it alone And they actually took the opportunity to reach out to the people that were coming to their website and got, you know, got to know those people again. So it was it was more around building that community of of audience rather than relying on the drop in drop outs that come from social media. Fascinating. Yeah, depending who you talk to, depending, you know, some people have obviously switched it back on and my news feed is now full of a whole lot of news content that I Absolutely, don't me need too. to be exposed to. <laughs> and then you've got <laughs> those that, that love it. Yeah. Interesting. So what is the most valid argument to have data used for the greater good? And I'm thinking of, you know, during the pandemic, for example, you know, the check-in that we've all got used to doing, our our little scan everywhere we go for the contact tracing in case there was an outbreak. Obviously, that's an example where it's used for the good. But I guess a lot of us are a little bit paranoid that they're just using it so they can sell us stuff or um, listen in our conversations and and maybe use that in a different different capacity. What, What would be the argument sort of to balance that out? Look, I think the COVID example is, is a really good one. Unfortunately, that wasn't as successful as as I, they were kind of predicting it to be. I think it had the potential to be really successful, but there were just too many limitations within the, the, the COVID app 
to, to actually be as successful as it can be. But the one area where I feel that data is only just really starting to be used and used for the good is in the medical industry. No, that you know, you can jump online now, and and med tech is one of the strongest growing industries out there in in the technology space. And one of the examples that I that I like to use is there was this this lady who she worked in AI and data in the US. I've, I've unfortunately forgotten her name. She actually came down with breast cancer, and they somebody had said to her, "Oh, you know, if we'd known about these symptoms earlier, we could have you know started." therapy a little bit earlier. So she, out of frustration, decided to build a predictive model using machine learning and data that would use a whole lot of historical patient data to be able to basically conduct studies and then analyze the data of the thousand bre- of thousand or so breast cancer patients, which could build tools to detect early stages of breast cancer. So in this example, it was you know they're sitting on a gold mine of of patient data with it, with breast cancer that wasn't being used. She decided to use that and build it into uh, machine machine learning and has now built this tool which can help detect early stages. Which that to me is incredible. That's absolutely amazing. Mm. Changing tack a little bit, if you could just choose one song, a book, or a film or a series that always makes your heart skip a beat, what would you choose and why does it speak to you? little bit old school and this is probably slightly off off topic in relation to data but anything Jim Reeves I'm a bit of a bit of an old school music person and you know my grandfather was a huge influence in my in my upbringing and I credit a lot of my success today to my grandfather and he's he used to be able to sing just like Jim Reeves and Jim Reeves was his favorite singer so now no matter where I am if I hear Jim Reeves I just it it it's amazes me how it can just take me back to a, a memory, a smell, a place. And I think that, you know, music has the, that one powerful thing where it can just take you back to a particular time in your life. And so, yeah, I'd have to say Jim Reeves. Excellent. So everyone's probably had a couple of mentors in their life. Are there any that particularly stand out for you and how have they impacted perhaps your view of the world or even your career to date? Yeah, look, there's been quite a few mentors in my life. I haven't actually had like an official one that I've looked up to my whole whole career. There's been there's been people that I've been very lucky enough to work under some incredible senior women, the likes of Pippa Leary and Jane Huxley at Fairfax. You know, they were women that you'd you'd look up to in in awe. In in particular, Jane Huxley. You know, she's somebody that I saw her speak a couple of times and. When you're really proud to work for that person, you know, it was, it was quite a quite a special thing. But in relation to completely, you know, non, non-data people, non-media people, my, uh, you know, I said that my grandfather had a big role in my life. My grandmother did. She was the matriarch of the family. She still is. You know, last year she, she had a um, quadruple bypass and survive that in the middle of COVID. She's an incredibly strong, st- stubborn woman. Good genes there, Alice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But she was, she's, uh, she has been a businesswoman for most of her life. And, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that I know now, I've been taught from her. She put me on a stage at, at the age of 10 and taught me public speaking and and uh, she helped me with me with debating. And so I think my grandparents have played a huge role in, in who I am and they've been probably my biggest mentors to date. And to wrap up today, what would be your overarching message for anyone navigating the politics of data? First and foremost, and it's something I'm most passionate about, is just because you can doesn't mean you should. I'm constantly having discussions with clients where they're like, oh, maybe we could do this. I'm like, technically you can, but don't. Because I, th- I think because you can now capture so much data and you can capture so much incredible information that there's this, uh, we seem to remove the ability of, but should we really do this? And or what is going to be the negative impact of, on my consumers if, if we collect this data? And the whole the whole thing that I use here is the the listening in. I do believe that social media apps are listening into conversations, and I do believe that ads are being targeted to people based on con- private conversations. So if I'm a brand, that would be incredibly valuable. Oh God, if people are talking about chocolate cakes and I sell chocolate cakes, then yeah, let's get my ad in front of them right away. 
but you shouldn't because the negative impact on your brand is huge. I've done research on it and it's due to be released soon and it's so damaging for brands where people feel that they've been served an ad that they don't believe has been served to them in with good purpose. So, yeah, just because you can doesn't mean you should. A cautionary tale of data. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the program today. Um, if you do want to connect for, further with Alice, there are some details of her LinkedIn profile and her website on the show notes. You have been listening to The Politics of Everything. Until next time, keep well. Thanks so much for listening today. If you've enjoyed The Politics of Everything, I thrive on your feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network through Apple, Spotify, and all the usual suspects. I'm always on the hunt for new and diverse guests. So if you or someone you know has a fresh idea you're busting to get out there, please email me at amber at amberdanes.com and my crew will get back to you very soon.